Let's see here. Most people who don't code don't appreciate how hard it is to really get it right. Plenty of developers out there are perfectly functional. I was. Um, but to watch a master really weave beauty out of code is truly majestical. It's inspiring. You fall in love. Unfortunately, most of the code that underpins most of the services that all of you and I use is crap. It's barely functional, it's filled with bugs, it's got all sorts of problems. I think of it as having a lot of digital duct tape, right? Um, now think of it this way and, and make a parallel to another environment. We are simultaneously in this sector building bridges, sewage systems, and skyscrapers. Now some of the bid, br uh, bridge b builders actually have civil engineering degrees. Some of the sewage builders kind of know something about plumbing. But most of the folks who are building skyscrapers have really only had experience building tree houses and taken a few classes of math, right? That's where we're at in a lot of this space. Oh, and by the way, there aren't yet inspectors, so we haven't figured that part of it out yet. So code is increasingly becoming key to civic life, to the civic technologies that we're talking about, things that are becoming part of everyday life, but we're not thinking about all of the mechanisms of accountability that we need to start thinking about. We focus on some, but we don't think about all of the externalities. My goal today is to give you two, to give you two places to look at to think about where this is going. How many of you use Gmail in this room? How many of you get social media service notifications to your Gmail account on a regular basis? Twitter, Facebook, admit it, there's a lot of you. Now think about that, each notification um, is roughly 50 kilobytes, right? All right, it's not so bad. A day's worth for a typical active user is about one megabytes of not notifications. All right, now if half of Gmail users get that per day, we are talking about 90 petabytes of notifications per year sitting on Google servers. All of that is sitting live, all of that is sitting there so that you can go and find every notification you've ever gotten. Like you're really curious when Mika and Andy, um, Andrew finally friended you, right? That's there somewhere in the dark past. Is this really a good use of the things that we're building? When the public hears the notion of the cloud, they think of these nice white fluffy things, right? The things that give us, give us the core of life, the things that give us water. Now, most of the clouds we build, they don't give us, they take us. They take a whole slew of things that we often like to forget about. Rare earth metals, <coughs> land, power, water. And so much so that there's a really mature conversation starting to happen amongst data center brokers to really think about carbon neutrality. And I'm proud to work at a company who's really been invested in all of that. Um, but the thing is, is that there's a lot more that goes on to thinking about the environment than just thinking about the data centers. We need to go a lot further than that. And part of it has been thinking about it in terms of code. Most developers out there have never even heard the phrase green code. They haven't thought about all of the, the costs of laying out tons of data, their embedded for loops, all of the things that are key to what they build. There's no notion of a lead certified code process. But we don't think about it in those terms. At best, we think about it as efficiency or computational complexity or the cost that we might have to pay to a, to a service that we use. But we don't think about it in terms of the environment. Likewise, many product designers never imagined it as such, right? What does it mean to think about notifications in that way? There's a really rich conversation happening about notifications. Do users want them? Are they gonna like them? Is it gonna be annoying? I have never once heard one of those conversations think about what it means to put every notification live on a hot server for future search. That's just not part of the frame. And I have to say, as somebody who really fought for getting data available, I never thought of it. So are we really better off as we're starting to think about this? I think about it in terms of open data. What does it mean that we're putting out tons of more open data out there in the hopes that somebody might one day use it and in the meantime it's sitting live on server? I had a great conversation with the head of um, NOAA. Um, they had thought about putting out data for climate change analysis. They never thought about the cost to climate change that their constant open data that nobody used might have. Don't get me started about blockchain, 3D printing, Internet of Things. We haven't even worked out the environmental impact of any of those. At least Bitcoin got one thing right. This really is about mining, and we need to start thinking about it as such. 
All right, section number two, different way of thinking. In the early 2000s, Google thought that I was a truck driver. This was really funny, all right? And I got the best advertisements. You should try it. It's pretty cool when you're a trucker. How many of you have dealt with a service who got you completely wrong in advertising, right? It's kind of fun, right? You laugh. Now, how many of you have ever been arrested? How many of you have ever been incarcerated? Take a moment to think about the accuracy of the systems that we are building in the world of advertisements and realize that we're importing them increasingly into the world of incarceration. Now, I struggle with this because it's really funny when you predict that I'm wrong for advertisements, but it's not so funny when we're talking about a whole set of predictions about people's ability to have access to freedom, to life. There's a ton of oversight that's coming into advertising, fighting and figuring that out. There is very little oversight into what we're doing in terms of using these things in criminal justice. Now, inaccuracy and bias are a total given in, a, in the advertising world. We just take it, we roll with it, we figure a little bit of accuracy is good enough. But what is good enough in criminal justice? Is it okay that we're using extraordinarily biased data sets about previous arrest records to, um, uh, and to predict future arrests or where police officers are stationed? Is it okay that we're assessing somebody's risk at the point of arrest and judging whether or not they will get bail, bond, probation, and sentencing dependent on the algorithms that we actually know are pretty shitty? Is it okay that local law enforcement agencies are asking tech vendors in this room to help predict which children are going to commit a crime before they're the age of 21? Who is deciding what is appropriate for use in the criminal justice space? And who is holding them accountable? Now, we might have different political uh, commitments when it comes to criminal justice. But when it comes to tech and data analysis, I hope everyone in this room shares a commitment to, uh, to accuracy, to trying to figure out what is ground truth, to try to make sense of the data that we're using. The models that we build have consequence. Now, you may not know much about criminal justice, but take for account a moment to realize that 96% of cases in the United States are plead out, which means they never see a jury of their own peers. And when you think about that, it's like, okay, well, what's going on? We've got a burden criminal justice system, right? Well, at a minimum right now, over 10%, and it's probably far higher, of people who plea out are actually innocent. And you might ask why, and if you've never been arrested, it may seem really strange. Just here in town, if you've been arrested and you don't get out on bail, and you're sitting in Rikers, you have an average of 600 days, average of 600 days until you see a court date, unless you plea. You, if you're innocent, and you're sitting here thinking about what all you're going to lose by sitting in Rikers, of course you're gonna plea out. It's the easiest way to get back to your family. Now, it's interesting to think about what we've done with drug policy. I'm not gonna ask how many of you in the room have done drugs, um, but I'm gonna guess that number is not exactly small. Um, <laughs> but who is really getting arrested for them? I'd argue most of us in the room are not the ones who are. Research has shown for a very long time that people of color, and particularly blacks, are far less likely to do and sell drugs than whites. Who gets arrested? 13% of the US population is black. Over 60% of those in prison are black. And most of it has to do with drug crimes. Because blacks are more likely to be arrested, more likely to be prosecuted and serve time, guess what our algorithms tell us about who is likely to commit a crime and where drug crimes occur? Police aren't using predictive policing tools to find the college campus, the dorm that's most likely to be using drugs. They're being sent to the hood and they're being sent there because algorithms are increasingly telling them that that's where they should go. Engineers argue that judges and police officers and everybody else in the criminal justice system should know the limits of the data that they use, the systems and the tools and the dashboards that they're being given. And I'm actually impressed. Many of them actually do. Many of them completely ignore the information that they're getting from the tools and algorithms that people in our community are building. But they've still paid millions of dollars of taxpayer money for a technology that they're then going to ignore. Is that a good thing? And increasingly in a world of public accountability where police are being punished for not knowing that someone was a risk before they shoot up a church, 
They're being required to actually show why they're not using the technology that we're building, why they're not listening to the recommendations. This is how racism gets built into the system. And civic tech is implicated in every aspect of it. We are architecting all sorts of discriminatory approaches into technology. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what your politics are. If you don't actively seek to combat prejudice and discriminatory and biased data sets built into systems, you are building prejudicial systems. examples highlight how decisions in tech can have all sorts of externalities, things that we don't think about because tech used to be its own sector. It used to be a place that felt safe and appropriate. It's now part of everything and we need to think about the moral responsibilities of that. So how do we start to look beyond our own mind's eye of development? We all need to wake up. Our technology is powerful and we need to be aware of the consequences of the code. Now, before our industry went all perpetual beta on everybody, we used to live in a world where we actually cared about tests and quality assurance. It meant something, it was important. And rooted in those were a domain and a practice where we thought about internal technical audits, right? It came in different languages, but we used to think about how to make certain our systems work the way they should. We need to get back to this. It is not okay to just say, fuck it, break it. That's not okay when we're talking about people's lives. We need to be able to answer very simple questions about our code. Does the system that we built actually produce the output that is appropriate given the known constraints? Do we understand the biases and limitations of the system and our data that we're working with? Are those clear to the end users so that they can make meaningful sense of what they're seeing? Or are we encouraging them to, to think inappropriately because we don't give them the right information? What are true social and environmental costs of what we're doing? Not just economic costs, social and environmental costs. We need to start having a public conversation about trade-offs. And to get there, it's not about transparency of data or transparency of algorithms. It's about the thought process that goes into the architecture of our systems. Now, audits don't have to be adversarial. They can be a way of honestly assessing the limitations of a system and benchmarking for improvement. This approach, mind you, is not without huge limitations. But if you can't understand if a model is helping or hurting, discriminating or resulting in false positives, you should not be implementing it in an environment where people's lives, freedoms, and liberty are at stake. Stick to advertising. Okay. Technology can be amazingly empowering, but only when it's implemented in a responsible manner. And that requires all of us to start making commitments to thinking about the ramifications of everything we do. Code doesn't create magic. It is not the thing that will transform society just by happening. It does it because of how we are there and what we do with it. And without the right checks and balances, it can easily be abused and misused. So in the world of civic tech, my ask of all of you is to start conscientiously, intentionally, and actively thinking about the social and environmental costs, just like urban planners do. Thank you. <laughs>